Okay, thank you for the introduction. I'm very happy to be here. I will be talking, as she said, I will be talking about phase transition in time reversible Navier Stokes equations. And this has three keywords which all together sound a bit confusing, and let's see if we can make some sense of it. So uh, even before I start, I will give the summary to begin with. So what I'm trying to do here is, the motivation of the problem is, stems from the following question. How does irreversible macroscopic behavior arises from time reversible microscopic dynamics in complex systems with infinitely many degrees of freedom, okay? Uh, and this has been intensely studied in the field of non-equilibrium statistical mechanics, but in the context of turbulence, uh, better understanding is still desirable, okay? So for classical fluid systems, Navier-Stokes equations, uh, you know, serve as a good starting point for turbulence modeling. But then you also have a viscous dissipation term in the Navier-Stokes equation, which explicitly breaks the time reversal invariance. Okay, and this, which is not restored in the limit of, you know, vanishing viscosity that is at very high Reynolds number uh, in a three-dimensional fully developed turbulence limit uh, because of, uh, you know, this, what is called as dissipative anomaly. We will come to it. So what we would like to do here, we would, you know, uh, take an alternative approach this time and we will use an idea that was put forth by uh, Giovanni Galavotti that we will deal with uh, something called as equivalence of non-equilibrium ensembles and try to make use of that and use governing equations that are formally time reversible, okay? So it is in that spirit. And this is kind of a infection diagram, like who infected whom with the idea, okay? So this is basically a joint work. And before I start, uh, you know, turbulence as a phenomenon is ubiquitous in natural and, and uh, in industrial flows, okay? So whether you're on planet Earth or outside it, you can't escape it. Uh, so the systems being so wide, you know, widely distributed, that is impossible to give a very generic definition. And the one which I like, from a review article of Dan Lathrop and his student is that I regard turbulence as a dynamic field that is especially complex, aperiodic in time, and involves processes that span over a wide range of spatial length and time scales, okay? Given this philosophical definition, let's get down to the nitty gritty practical aspect. Consider three-dimensional turbulence, okay, which is forced by uh, for, uh, you know, some kind of uh, external force at certain length scale, which maintains the turbulent flow. So the energy is in injected at certain length scale, let's say LF, okay? And then the nonlinear processes, you know, transfers the energy to smaller length scales uh, until a length scale where it is dissipated by the viscous dissipation, okay? So what we have and what we know is the resulting macroscopic dynamics is irreversible. And this dissipation term in particular breaks the invariance under this transformation if you send t to minus t and u to minus u. Uh, study of irreversibility in turbulence uh, has attracted a, you know, major attention in recent years. Uh, so people have been looking at, you know, dispersion of particles or fluid particles in turbulent flow, how they separate, and their conditioning on forward and backward time. So there are many important papers here, and in the audience, Rahul and Shamriddhi of late have been interested in this, in these. So let's directly come to the idea that I'm going to make use of, is equivalence conjecture. So what Galavati says, subject the fluid not to usual viscous dissipation, but to a modified dissipation mechanism, such that the governing equation is a time reversible invariant, okay? And this stems in some sense from, you know, chaotic hypothesis and in bits and pieces has to do with galavati cohen fluctuation theorem. But okay, taking this forward, he conjectures an equivalence between time reversible formulation and the standard Navier-Stokes equation that holds in the limit of high Reynolds number as a consequence of more general equivalence of dynamical ensembles for non-equilibrium systems, okay? So what is essentially happening 
the modified dissipation term uh, with what we call a reversible viscosity that will become clear in a bit balances exactly the energy injection statistics thereby resulting in a prescribed macroscopic observable such as total energy or entropy to be constant in time. And now what this gives us, if this conjecture is true, then we have two distinct approaches that model microscopic dissipation differently but yield an equivalent macroscopic behavior. So this is the broad idea that we are going to use. So what we are doing, we are imposing a global constraint in, in such a fashion that the total kinetic energy is constant of the system. So an easy way is to see that if you take the Navier-Stokes equation, take a dot product with the uh, you know, velocity and if the energy is constant, constant del E by del T vanishes and from the energy balance you can immediately fish out that the visco viscosity, resulting viscosity is given by the ratio of the injection energy and the instrophy, okay, the curl of velocity. And this term, when plugged into the Navier-Stokes equation, makes the entire equation invariant under this transformation, okay. And there have been some studies of this system, particularly in reduced models of turbulence such as shell model. Uh, but, I mean, for the first time, we are exploring this in a full Navier-Stokes simulation. So the study that we are doing is, is essentially numerics, okay. So uh, we solve the reversible Navier-Stokes equation in a triply periodic domain, use standard pseudospectral method, uh, and evolve in time using second order Runge-Kutta scheme. Okay, and you can choose initial data and forcing. So if you look here, so you already have one parameter U0 and another parameter F0, okay? So, so before you proceed further, let's say you have given three pa parameters in your problem and you would like to construct some dimensionless control parameter and that, that's what we do. We make use of the forcing amplitude, injection length scale, energy injection length scale, and the total energy, kinetic energy, which is constant in the system and out of it construct a parameter which is non-negative, okay? And this actually, quantifies the balance between the fluctuation of the kinetic energy at the injection length scale and the total energy of the system, okay? And to just to remind you, this is not a Reynolds number or an inverse thereof, okay? Uh, so if you stare hard at this equation, you can think of two protocols. If you fix the forcing length scale, okay? So what you can do, you can keep energy constant and vary the forcing amplitude to study the statistical properties in a systematic way, or you can do the vice versa. You keep F0 fix and vary E0 from the initial state. So we'll make use of these two protocols. And now, so if you again look at this equation, you can think of two asymptotic limits. One when R is zero, okay? And the other when R is infinity. R zero actually will uh, correspond to an Euler equation which is freely evolving and this is a you know a joint limit in which the viscosity and the forcing amplitude which to, uh, together vanish okay and since we are dealing with you know numerics here and I can uh, split my velocity field into Fourier modes and I'm dealing with finite number a uh, finite resolution problem so I have a maximum wave number in the system and there and a minimum wave number and thereby have a maximum number of Fourier modes in the problem that together gives me a sense that I am dealing with a finite degrees of freedom, okay? And so this limit is very much related with what is very well known in the turbulence literature is called truncated Euler equation, okay? So if you evolve the system for long numerically, what happens? the system eventually thermalizes, okay? And what you observe, uh, and it has solutions which are called absolute equilibria, and you observe a statistical equipartition of energy between different Fourier modes, okay? So that's one limit, and the other limit is uh, of a very high forcing, where forcing amplitude is almost going to infinity, 
And what you have is essentially an overdamped dynamic because as the forcing goes very high, the viscosity generated in response to is also very high, okay? So we have these two asymptotic regimes and we want to see what is happening as we vary R, you know, and want to probe what is happening in the crossover region. So, so what I'm doing here to characterize the statistical properties, I'm plotting the time average value of the reversible viscosity and entropy, and a quick look as a function of a, you know, a dimensionless control parameter, and a quick look at these two uh, plots shows that we, you can easily identify two regimes, one at small r and the other at large r, and similarly here. And this will correspond to, you know, a warm phase, what we call, and the one on the higher r corresponds to hydrodynamic phase. Warm phase because here we are dealing with a situation, as we will see later, with a partial ultraviolet thermalization, okay? So the system is very sensitive to what is happening at the smallest length scale, which has been introduced artificially in numerical simulation. And the other one is a hydrodynamic regime, uh, hy uh, hydrodynamic regime, uh, where uh, the system is uh, excessively damped, okay? Uh, so, and it doesn't feel the cutoff scale at all, okay? And now if you look at the viscosity uh, as a function of R in, the, in this phase, what you see uh, that it increases and, I mean, for, for increases with R and has a finite positive value. And what you also see is that uh, there is a good data collapse, okay? S essentially saying that things are independent of, uh, you know, the maximum resolution of the system and, uh, and similarly, uh, here, what you see is some kind of a power law, which you can actually uh, describe using uh, Kubo dissipation theorem and, and get to see how it scales with, you know, R2. And then there is a crossover uh, region in which the order parameter, uh, you know, smoothly goes from a, uh, one phase to the other phase. And for the entropy, you see that you can fit up, uh, you know, a square root profile, okay? And if you look at the dynamic evolution of the entropy, so there are very low fluctuations at the, you know, at the very high or small values of R, but at the intermediate, you see the time series is bursty, and you can quantify that by looking at the fluctuations, uh, you know, and looking at the standard deviation, and which is quite reminiscent of, you know, the continuous phase transition that we, we know very well, okay? So the scalings here and the exponents here Okay, I will not bet my life on it, but this is what we have, and it all hints at a continuous phase transition. So we can also do a, you know, spectral characterization. So at, in the hydrodynamic regime at very large R, what you have, the energy is like concentrated around the forcing length scale, and at the other end, you have something which is distributed across length scales. So a feature uh, which is quite reminiscent of a turbulent behavior. And on the warm side, you have a mixture or a rather coexistence of the two regimes, hydrodynamical and, and the phase, okay? And so, so then there is a range of a R where you can say that you have a region where the Navier-Stokes turbulence is very similar to a turbulence which is given by the RNS system. So this is an artificial system, but we hope to describe the actual turbulence using that, okay? And we also did one particular simulation where we, ch you know, use the viscosity which was generated in the RNS system, fed it to Navier-Stokes, and we find that there's some tr uh, truth in the conjecture, and it holds quite well. Thank you. Thank you.